Hello and welcome everyone. Um, really good to see so many people dialing in. Welcome to the third masterclass of this series on scaling DRT using a flexible demand platform and a vehicle, um, a flexible vehicle supply model to grow patronage efficiently. My name is Asia Jelani and I'm an account director at research and technology company TRL Limited. We have a vision for clean, efficient transport that's safe, reliable and accessible. And we conduct research across the public and private sector um, and, and conduct trials. Now, in my not too distant past, I spent several years developing and launching the demand responsive bus service Arriva Click. So I'm very pleased to chair today's panel discussion. And I'm delighted to be joined today by some great speakers. Um, Jack Holland's a leader in delivery and execution of new mobility services. He spent his early career running bus operations for Arriva and then moved on to delivering projects for various mobility startups, Arriva Click, Zelo, Rideon and Padam Mobility. Um, he's worked on a number of high profile services in England and Scotland. He now heads up business development in the, in the UK for Padam Mobility. Uh, a DRT platform with over 80 operations globally, including five in the UK. So welcome, Jack. And we also have Dan Mould. Dan is the CEO of WeDRT. He founded the company in 2020 after running a private hire bus technology platform for a year after working in insurance and AI. Dan has implemented a, a very unique flexible supply model for DRT in Co Coventry after winning future transport zone funding from Transport for West Midlands and the University of Warwick in 2021. And after a great early adoption, this service has now scaled up to a 10 vehicle operation that flexes supply in response to demand via the WE DRT solution. Dan's currently building technology to scale the offering uh, along with other procurement and operation tools in transport. So good to have you here, Dan. Uh, so let's kick off some discussions and I think a note has just gone into the chat to remind uh, everybody dialed in. Please feel free to add your questions into the chat um, and we will get to those later in the discussion. Um, so Jack, first of all, uh, you've been working in DRT for some years now. Can you share a little more with the audience about your current role in Padam's DRT solution? Sure. Thank you, Asia. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, I'm Jack Holland. I lead BD in the UK for Padam Mobility. Um, I will just go through a really brief two minute introduction in what we do um, and uh, sort of how we scale DRT. Um, so Padam have been um, a DRT platform since 2014. Um, since uh, they started, they've looked to integrate DRT with uh, transport operators and local authorities. So they've always been focused on shared rides and uh, sort of shared DRT rather than uh, ride hailing. Um, in, in 2021, uh, Padam had been purchased by Siemens. So we're now uh, fully part of the Siemens family. Um, and Siemens IMS are looking to integrate a whole host of different uh, mobility providers from ticketing to mass to reservations and DRT. Um, so we're now part of this family of companies coming together to uh, sort of interlink and, and, and uh, build a modular mass platform. So in terms of our use cases, um, PADAM um, operate around about 80 different DRT operations globally. Um, our main customers are local authorities and operators, but we also run corporate shuttles. Um, and we've also uh, just this year started to launch some autonomous vehicle trials. Um, our core focus is on rural areas and peri-urban areas. Um, we, as uh, a philosophy, think that DRT should mainly be provided in gaps in existing transport networks and shouldn't be added as an additional layer in very highly dense uh, urban environments. Um, we have a whole range of different service configurations, so we can mix and match these different modes of DRT based on where the demand is. So, for example, we can operate feeder services um, in the morning and afternoon peaks and then flip the service to free floating uh, any bus stop to any bus stop in the middle of the day where there's more capacity for the system. So we really spend a lot of time analysing 
um, what the use case is, where there's gaps in the existing network, and really complementing it through mixing and matching different modes at different times based on based on where the demand is. And just to give you a quick example of how and where we've scaled, um, in Paris, uh, we actually operate uh, the largest demand responsive bus service in Europe. This service started around about four years ago um, with just a handful of vehicles operating in one or two zones. We've worked really closely with the Paris Greater Authority to really identify where the gaps are in their transport network. And although it's a Paris uh, operation, which is obviously a global city, um, some of these zones can be up to 30 miles, 40 miles um, from the city centre in very rural locations uh, where previously there was little to no transport. These 40 different zones have 120 vehicles in them and they serve over 60 metro stations carrying over 250,000 people each year into the uh, sort of interurban bus routes and the underground and interurban trains. Um, there's eight different operators who all operate through one singular platform. So that just shows, I suppose, a little bit of how we scale. Um, so, yeah, that's a brief introduction and I'll hand back to Asya. Thanks, Jack. And, you know, you've covered a lot there. There's a lot of good, flexible examples, use cases and flexible models. I'm sure we'll come back to, to that in the discussion later. Um, but Dan, coming over to you, um, can you tell us a little bit about the background to WeDRT? What does it do and why did you set it up? Yeah, thanks, Asya, for the intro. Um, and thanks to Dan for inviting us on today. Um, so. We DRT is, if you think of PADAM as the technology side of putting on DRT, we handle the entire stack of the, the operation side. So We DRT is really a turnkey solution for operating efficient, scalable DRT services. Uh, so how do we do this? Um, if we can go on to the next slide, I'll show you some key features of our solution. And um, first of all, a really important one, which we'll get onto the reasons why later, is we run DRT with flexible supply. So we do this for our tool on our dynamic procurement platform. Um, so we use a core fleet of, of statically fixed um, contract um, suppliers. Uh, we use this for the majority um, of, of a DRT service. And we also then have a, a network of local suppliers. This can be from a range of different services, private hire, SEN, community transport operators. Um, and it's through this flexible network that we flexibly dispatch and supply. So our DRT services have that flex flexible supply base. Um, what else we do is DRT operations. So these are the teams involved in running all the stack of day-to-day -day operations. And uh, so we've got live operations. So we have a call center. Uh, this is for uh, people who might not be able to use or might not want to use the app to book in. Um, so we deal with the call center, all the driver ops, and we have people dealing with suppliers and kind of nurturing the relationships with our suppliers, both the core and the flexible fleets. Uh, lastly, we've got marketing and growth teams. So we're really interested in not just putting on the buses, but actually trying to drive some demand um, in the services. We're really focused on actually making the DRT service successful, um, not just putting on the buses. So we're involved with the marketing growth. So trying to drive patronage, uh, whether that be through digital marketing, helping with open days, or doing street marketing events. Uh, so that's the overview, really, of a, of a DRT, we DRT solution. Thanks, Dan. And again, really interesting. So yeah, um, kind of all three corners of the triangle um, that we look at for DRT, really. So we talk about the technology, we talk about the operations, and importantly, as you said, the growth, the marketing. Um, how do how do you uh, stimulate and generate uh, further demand? So. So great intros, thanks guys. Um, so let's get on to some questions. Uh, we'll we'll start with an easy one, shall we? Um, what, um, Jack? I'll come to you first. What, where, where do you see the DRT market currently in the UK, and and how do you see it developing over the next few years? Yeah, sure. So um, we were quite early on, Asia, when we uh, launched the Reva Click. Um, in that we were the first. Um, operator to launch with Via's platform outside of the States. So that was quite innovative um, in 2018, maybe 2017. Can't really remember the exact year. Um, and since then, actually, um, 
a lot of operators um, and local authorities across Europe have really gone on to launch their own um, DRT projects. I, I believe there's over 800 uh, dynamic uh, DRTs live globally at the moment. Um, so the UK, um, we were obviously quite early in terms of adopting some of the, the first trials. Um, we have been quite slow to um, to look at some of the more larger scale projects. Um, so it's only been in the last sort of 12, 18 months that um, pots of funding have become available through the Royal Mobility Fund, the FTZs, um, to really um, have some more uh, DRT focused um, trials. Um, so we, we've been slightly uh, more gradual in terms of how we've scaled it. Uh, for example, uh, there is, I don't know, 15 different regions in, in France and every single region has uh, quite large scale DRT projects, um, multiple zones, um, sort of upwards of 10 to 20 vehicles in, e in each, in each uh, territory operating multiple different zones. So um, there's only a, a one or two use cases of that in the UK currently. Actually, one of them in particular has been around for over 20 years in Call Connect, um, and they're now starting to um, digitalize their service with, with our platform. Um, so, so we now have started to take over some of the Call Connect services, um, which have been hugely innovative um, um, in how they uh, how they grow. Um, so yeah, I think um, we're, we're, we're on the uh, the sort of ladder to starting to scale. I think we can get a lot of learnings from what has and hasn't worked um, in Europe, in the US, um, and we can start to look to more longer term contracts um, with really clear KPIs um, into if you achieve this patronage, then let's grow the service. So for example, we've, we've, we've just won a 10 year contract in Germany with one of the local authorities there. So the, the DRT has a, a 10 year lifespan in that project and there'll be clear KPIs throughout that in how we grow and scale it. Thanks, Jack. That's really interesting to, uh, and particularly bringing in kind of the the difference, I guess, the, um, with, with the way some of the European countries are looking at it versus the UK. Dan, have you got um, anything different that you would add there in terms of how you see the DRT market currently and in the future? Yeah, kind of just echoing what Jack just said. I think it's really exciting time to see, because we've seen in the UK, yeah, we, we might be slow adopters compared to the US and, and parts of Europe. Um, but it's actually really exciting to see it kind of go from the mentality in a few places of going from, yeah, it's a trial, it's a one year, two year trial into going into this is actually a service that we put on full time. Uh, it's really helping residents. Um, so yeah, it, it's really, it's really encouraging and exciting to see that. So that's why it's so important now to talk about how do we actually scale this efficiently, um, both in the tech and in the supply side. Thanks, Dan. And I can see lots of questions coming in, so um, keep them coming. Um, if it's okay with everyone, I will come back to them. I, I note that some are some relate to some of what Jack said around the comparison between France and the UK, uh, and, and is that relevant? Um, but um, if we just carry on um, a little bit further into the scaling discussion, then I will definitely come back to the questions if that's OK. Um, so. Sorry, so um, in, in terms of um, scaling, which is what this masterclass is really about, um, Jack, for you, this question really, what is a scaled DRT? What is what, you know, what does scaling mean and why is it important to think about scaling when you're setting up a new DRT service um, or, or converting an existing dial uh, service into a DRT system? Why does it matter? You're on mute, Jack. That would help. Um, um, yeah, for me, scaling is one of two different things, really. Uh, the first is having multiple um, zones across quite a large scale region um, that have a specific purpose in complementing the existing public transport network. Um, so these zones don't um, necessarily extract from the existing uh the existing network they look to integrate and actually one of the questions um i've noticed from from roger sexton was about how we can guarantee that um that integration and we can actually put um timetables into our back office so that 
um, there's certain rules in place for the DRT. So they meet the bus or the train at set times and they know that they have to be at a specific point. So they have maybe 45 minutes to go around collecting people and then go back to a specific point, maybe four to five minutes before departure. So we've got a whole host of different use cases where we do that. The second part of scaling, and I think this is especially important for the UK market where we live in a different um, sort of, uh, we live in a sort of denationalized uh, sort of mindset is looking at holistically where we spend money um, on transport and looking at how we can um, cross subsidize uh, different modes so that the the overall cost is reduced for the local authority. So, for example, we're speaking with one local authority in the UK at the moment to overlap their existing uh, dialer ride with a corner to corner service. So some of the vehicles will be dedicated to door to door transport. Other vehicles will be dedicated to corner to corner and then some will do both. They have quite a large fleet that do door to door and they have a handful of vehicles currently doing corner to corner. And the aim is, is to reduce that fleet by having more um, more grouped rides, especially with their door to door transport to reduce the vehicle fleet, reduce the overall cost. And actually, that is how you make DRT commercially viable in the UK. It's looking at these different subsidised pots, be it home to school, be it um, be it dialer rides, even being corporate shuttles and how you can blend these different models. Um, and it's it's about starting small, learning what works and what doesn't and then and then growing it from there. OK, thanks, Jack. And presumably when you're talking about blending these different services between corner to corner and door to door that um, is very much reliant on the user base that you're moving so um, you know presumably accessibility wise there'll be some people who will always require door to door but yeah. what you're really saying is for those that are mo more mobile there are potential efficiencies if they're able to walk to the end of the street or or that kind of thing I, I guess is what you're saying. Yeah there's, there's, there's that but there's also the uh, having having stronger algorithms in place so that you can more efficiently group people together as well and really thinking about um uh rather than having 2000 corner to corner bus stops is it more important to have maybe one or two per village or or per per town and then having the the sort of um the door to door uh, network over the top so the people that can um, walk to a bus stop they maybe have a 10 minute walk but that's how you're going to be able to group people together more efficiently so it's really thinking about this is the current price point this is how much we spend um, for it for each each mode and can yeah. we reduce that by blending um, different modes together so in, in Lincolnshire for example we uh, managed to uh, use some some school routes and we blended them with uh, commercial um, DRT and we, we half the price per passenger in terms of how much it costs the local authority. So so it's those types of use cases where you can see huge savings at a very small scale that then you can start to scale up. Thanks, Jack. Um, so I'll I'll bring Dan I'll I'll bring you into that question as well, um, and then I'll, and and then I will um, in the meantime have a look at some of the questions coming in for the audience um, on this particular topic and bring those in as well. So, Dan, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, just a small bit to add to that. Um, from an operation side, so what we actually see with wheels on the road um, in blending these services, when you silo different services that really at the end of the day have the same resource base. Um, you see really inefficient situations actually in person when, with the wheels on the ground. You see situations where there's maybe 15 minibuses all in siloed contracts and five in each siloed contract, where if you did pull and you now have the technological capability to pull with such as like softwares like Padans, um, it's now able to do that. So you have a situation where if we were managed, if we did manage to actually pull these fundings together, we can fulfill the same service with these 15 vehicles. We can now do it with 10. Um, and when you scale that up in the larger, larger areas, um, saving out on five minibuses, reducing your fleet by a third, um, really makes a big difference in terms of cost efficiency. 
Okay, thanks. And I, yeah, I, I'm going to come on and ask a question, actually, which will be useful, I think, for the audience to understand, which is how do Padam Mobility and We DRT work together um, and, and what's the benefit of that connection? Because I think you talked very much about operations and growth being the other side of the, the technology. But just to bring a couple of, pe couple of questions in. So, John, that's asking, is there a risk of designing too large a scale um, to start with and then having to scale back? Um, I guess that question is around, you know, is it better to grow uh, from a small base and scale up slowly? Um, you know, is there a risk with, with going too large too soon? And uh, Dan, as you've got the mic, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, yeah, I'd say there is a, a real big risk in, in oversupplying, um, just as there's a big risk in undersupplying. Um, I think we'll get onto this a, a bit later um, in, in more detail with kind of visual representations of that but oversupplying you get the situation that nobody wants you're paying for minibuses and drivers to be sat there idle um, and you can oversupply at the start and kind of wait for your demand to kind of rise until you are utilizing that vehicle um, but what we have kind of seen in the market um, and where the opportunities are to like make this more efficient um, is to actually have flexible supply where yes you have a core base of your kind of minimum viable um, supply base, so say three minibuses, and the fourth minibus that you don't know whether you can really utilize it all, you can then through our system um, actually mobilize that fourth vehicle flexibly, so you can have smaller chunks of supply, um, so that you're not actually ever under supplying, which is which is really bad for the service, under supply, uh, because you see customers not being able to book on or, or having long wait times, um, but actually not oversupplying too much which is dangerous in itself because you've got all this funding going towards minibus drivers sat idle. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a really big risk in oversupplying, um, just as there is the same risk of undersupplying. Um, so, therefore, you, you really need to look at having a flexible supply base. I'll pass and, over to Jack now, maybe. Yeah, I was going to say, Jack, um, interested in your thoughts, and I guess just building on what Dan said there. I guess it's a bit chicken and egg when you're starting a service and uh, unless you're taking over an existing um, service where the demand is known yeah. in terms of what what that demand is going to be, how it's going to peak and trough. Um, and, you know, it, you know, I know from my own history that you know, it's very much a flexible service, flexible supply. Absolutely. Um, is key to that. But how how do you know and how how do you know how you will start if you if you don't know much about your demand and also how do you build something that you can then it can then iterate and you can flex it as you go along yeah sure so i think the technology's come on quite a lot in the past two years um specifically so when we launched liverpool asia i think we we were still in a very sort of free floating mindset with drt where there wasn't the anti-competition rules as such they, uh, the feeder services were still in research and development in terms of the tech in, in many ways. So we were looking at how do we make DRT as commercially viable as possible? And to do that, we thought it was kind of the need to serve as many destinations as possible, cover as many uh, areas where there was heavily densely populated areas so that we had as much of a user base as possible. But Actually, what I've found in the past 12 months working with Padam is some of our strongest services are, are not necessarily the ones that cover a large area or that um, have loads of destinations. It's actually looking at where there's a really specific need and how can we restrain the perimeters of the service so that you're grouping high levels of people onto the service. So we've got use cases of feeder services that carry anywhere between five and 10 passengers per, per vehicle hour because they serve that specific need of serving a train station. And it's almost like it's any origin to a singular destination. Um, so if you look at some of Padam services, they may have anywhere between five and 40 different zones. But these are sort of micro DRTs that fill the gaps, serve um, existing networks and complement the networks by using restraints, using anti-competition measures um, 
so that actually it's not extracting from the existing network, but it's serving a specific need and feeding other services. And I think that's a really, really clever way of scaling. And it also means that you can start small and then and then grow sort of holistically with it. OK, thanks, Jack. And um, I'm going to bring in some questions now because we've had quite a few questions in the chat and um, there's there are some individual ones, but I'll, I'll group them together in the sense of the topic first, um, which is um, I think anyone who's worked in DRT would expect that there would be, be questions around this, um, around the commercial viable viability of DRT. Um, so, um, you know, there's been a couple of questions. Can DRT genuinely become a commercially viable proposition very quickly? Um, or does it, will it always rely on some level of funding long term? Um, and there's other linked ones. I'll just I'll, I'll give you them all together so that you, you can. I, I think you'll be able to answer them together, if that makes sense. Um, and really around the commercial dynamics of a DRT being dependent on load factors, which, you know, you talked about um, around how you get those efficiencies with grouping. From your experiences, what load factors are required per vehicle per trip to make DRT commercially viable? Um, and are there cost savings essentially in terms of, uh, or how can there be cost savings in terms of uh, transitioning uh, uh, existing services to DRT? So lots of questions in one, but but all linked. So um, so so Jack, I'll come to you first, and then yeah, and sure. then I'll I'll bring Dan in if that's okay. Yeah. So I think Dan's can comment really well about how his flexible supply can drive that cost down. What I'm just going to focus on is is I suppose my experiences from the past few years of operating DRT. So we um, obviously found, and I've, I've actually heard, heard Phil Southall use this same figure. So me as an ex-Ariva, Phil as a go-ahead, both running uh, DRT services, the magic number was around eight. You could probably, eight, and that's eight passengers per vehicle per hour. You could probably drive that down to seven by not spending as much on the marketing by trying to find some efficiencies. Um, and when we were operating Arriva Click Sittingbourne, we, we had grown it to between 4.5 to 5 passengers per vehicle hour. And actually, in the peaks, we were operating anywhere between 9 and 11 passengers per vehicle per hour. And actually, then it dropped way off in the off peak to one or two passengers per vehicle per hour. What I see there is an opportunity because you are able to carry quite high amounts of people in the peak. But actually, you can do two things in the off peak. You can either reduce the supply, which Dan will go on to, or you can look at what other transport modes are being used in that area. Is there door to door transport that you can allocate some of the vehicles to and really help the local authority drive down the, the cost in the middle of the day? Is there things to do with corporate shuttles that, that have potential private hire? So, no, I do not think um, you could you can have a profitable DRT service right now um, in terms of no subsidy required. But yes, I do think you can be commercially viable because commercially viable doesn't necessarily mean profitable. It means reducing the overall cost for, for a local authority. So if they're spending X amount of million pounds on uh, social transport, um, um, then then actually, if you're able to bring that cost down, I believe that's commercially viable. Thanks, Jack. And and Dan, um, I'm I'm conscious that I wanted to, to kind of tackle the questions coming in on the chat, um, but you know, one of the questions I did want to ask you was really around what the real impact is of flexible supply and uh, versus fixed supply, which. Um, will directly link to the commercial viability question because you know I you know I know from my history too um and others will know who run run DRT services or any transport services you know a huge part of your costs is the driver um the vehicle yes but um that's depreciated over years so it's it's the driver hours and um uh, often times uh in uh uh, existing services you are paying um, drivers when they're not moving anyone and uh, uh, having a flexible demand versus a fixed supply 
um, causes causes some friction in the system. So, um, so sorry, I'm bringing all the things together because I think they're all interrelated. So very interested in your answer to the commercial viability, but really opening up for you to talk about in a bit more detail about the 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 impact of flexible versus fixed, if it if it seems relevant to bring that in now. Yeah, yeah, I, I think to make DLT commercially viable, uh, especially at scale, um, you need that efficiency between the fundamentals, the supply and the demand of the service. And if you think about DRT, um, the demand is naturally responsive. Um, so to actually hit that sweet spot or equilibrium, you can call it, uh, you need to then have a flexible supply so you can match them as best you can with the market and constraints that there are with suppliers. Um, so I think the two key kind of inefficiencies that you see with, with many DRT services is the moments of oversupply, or you can have chronic oversupply. And that's when you kind of just, let's make sure we can fulfill every bit of demand. So let's just put on an extra vehicle. It's normally going to be sat there, um, idle, driver, minibus being paid for, um, but let's oversupply it. Or you can undersupply it, kind of use too, too little amount of, um, of minibuses or taxis or, or mini, midi coaches um, to supply that demand. Um, so therefore you get situations just as bad as oversupply where users on the app can try and book in but they can't find a seat there's not enough supply for that demand both are really damaging so in drt the optimal supply that you really want is flexible um, so that kind of brings down both inefficiencies um, it can also help you with fluctuations so we run a drt service in coventry um, it's partially funded by the university of warwick so in moments, in certain situations like this, you might have a certain user group that actually seasonally fluctuates in demand. You might see, say, on a Wednesday afternoon um, at universities where lots of people playing sport, lots of people using um, the service, you might actually find during putting on the service that, that you need more demand in certain areas. Um, so having a flexible supply model um, allows you to actually learn from the data that you've done after you've even mobilized the contract um, you can learn from that data and then you can actually implement those changes to better suit the um, the actual residents and, and the data you're getting um, so I think flexible supply is really good for finding that equilibrium uh, so not oversupplying chronically not under supplying chronically but the main uh, another key thing is dealing with seasonal fluctuations like on the go um, so it's really about being flexible being able to learn from the data that you're getting and then actually having the functionality to go ahead and and be flexible and iterate the service so that's how you kind of get towards an optimal service um, instead of kind of you can do all the all the simulations that you want you can you can kind of try and predict um, but if you don't have the functionality in your supply model to change and iterate when you get real data back and then you're always going to kind of be stuck. And so, um, and that's really interesting. And what makes sense in terms of a of a frequency with which to make those sorts of supply decisions? And um, I appreciate that it might not be one size fits all answer, but um, you know, it, are those is that looking at data daily, weekly, monthly? What what's the sort of cycle of that? Yeah. So to be able to do this um, flexible supply part, what you need is a net network of local suppliers and the best way to kind of put this network together is to have different suppliers from different service areas of for different types of service so having a few private hire operators a few sen a few community transport providers and bringing them all together um, gives you a large enough like spectrum to be able to if you do have, have um, flexible supply that you need maybe in two days time you're likely to be able to find that supply um, from the platform um, so it's really important to kind of spread your network across different services. Um, so they're all kind of doing different things and you can pull together um, the different kind of times that they would be available. Uh, that's a really important part. Um, so. um, and what's the incentive for fleet operators to, to do that, to, to come on? Because presumably, you know, fleets are owned for a reason um, mm. and they exist. What, what, what do you think the benefit is from, a, from the people or what are the people telling you who, you know, in your network? Um, as to why they want to be part of this wider group. 
Yeah, so it's really about extra utilization of what they've currently got in their resource base. Um, so you can imagine a private hire operator uh, does a lot of wedding trips and sports events on the weekends. Um, by being on our flexible network, we're kind of giving them the opportunity to utilize that resource, that minibus, that, that taxi they have, um, giving them the opportunity to utilize that more through the ad hoc work they can do by chipping in and doing chunks of supply on the local DRT. Um, so it really does use those um, merging of services principles um, and trying to kind of for the, for the supplier's point of view, um, we actually train them up on the DRT on the dam software um, and we actually kind of give them that for free. So yeah. they, get a, they get a free DRT enabling um, session and then they get the, the chance on top of that um, to kind of utilize ad hoc. So, so just last connected question for you, Dan, and then I'll uh, and then I'll change topic slightly and come come back to Jack. So, do you? Uh, someone's asked, do you believe that taxis can play a part in satiating the over demand um, more cost effectively than having a spare bus hanging around? Um, which I guess is the essence of 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 why your flexible supply um, exists. But you know, you mentioned taxis. How how important are they to the mix? Yeah, I think I think they will be really important, um, and we certainly look to implement that um, on the on the contracts that we do. Um, so, if you think about trying to match supply to demand, um, if you're looking at optimal demand, theoretically, um, this might the optimal demand for one type of day might end up being about three point two minibuses. That's the perfect optimal supply level for that certain demand. Um, so, being able to make the seats more granular. So being able to integrate taxis, you can therefore kind of put your supply into more, more definite, more granular um, kind of volumes. So in that way, you can closely, more closely um, match your supply with the demand, uh, which is at the end of the day, you're trying to get equilibrium. You're trying to eliminate oversupply and undersupply. So yeah, taxis are playing a really important role. And I think it's important on that point to realize that the optimal supply and the type of DRT service you do really depends upon the rurality or the, the population density or actually the demand for that route um, it actually really fluctuates. So say at the, at the end case, on a really, really rural area, a completely flexible supply is actually optimal, whereas on a super, super urban area, a more fixed model is more appropriate. And you have a spectrum, a scale of all the points in between those two extremes. Thanks, Dan. And that segues quite nice actually to the question I was going to bring in for you, Jack, um, which are what are the barriers in an urban and peri-urban area being operated by a different operator to the dominant scheduled big, big bus operator in the area? So how, um, from your experience, do you deal um, with those sorts of issues and um, you touched on it earlier, but you know, what are your real learnings from, from urban versus um, peri-urban versus rural? You on me? Okay. <laughs> um, so if I take, I think there's kind of two questions there. So the, the first one around if you're, you're an operator coming into an urban environment that has a dominant uh, bus operator in their area? Well, there's a, I suppose there's a couple of things there. Um, firstly, if the contract is by the local authority um, and they work closely with the bus operator and they've outlined that they specifically don't want to extract from the commercial network, which is what we're doing on a number of our uh, operations currently, then, then we can just simply put anti-competition rules in place so that um, the core bus network um, in a region is not getting extracted from um, and can can especially in this sort of post COVID period where we're, our patronage is still at 70 percent, maybe 75 percent of what it was pre COVID. It's so important not to extract any more passengers from the core bus operations in a region. So we can say we can do a number of things. We can just simply say between 6 a.m and 10 p.m. you can't travel from bus stop A to bus stop B if that is possible from a fixed line bus. So that's one option that's quite simple. 
we're actually working with one local authority where we're going to say if you can get a bus within an hour then um then you get a notification to say that you have to get on dave's buses um and here's the timetable and here's their website so because because that route is possible but if um it's longer than an hour wait then we're able to offer them a a drt so we can actually put in place timetables through through bots um into a journey planner in our back office and then put in place rules so that if it's a very long way it could be half an hour it could be 45 minutes this local authority have decided an hour because they've got a lot of services that run every two three four hours which just aren't that much of a positive user experience for their residents but they don't want to extract from their hourly bus route so we can do that in terms of the difference between running in a sort of peri-urban environment in the suburbs um compared to in a rural environment um it, with a peri-urban environment i think generally the key is to feed into um localized destinations if there is no other forms of transport so be it a hospital be it a shopping center in the local per perimeter and that's it the key is to feed interurban buses and trains so to to really think about designing the system so that maybe in the peak it's a feeder and then maybe in the off peak it's it's um free floating in a rural environment i think quite often there's not enough demand to do feeders so quite often you'll have a free floating zone any point to any point within that rural environment but quite often there's interurban bus routes that run through it so for example in lincolnshire there's the interconnect 101 bus and we put anti-competition rules in place along that bus route and the aim of the service is to feed into those transport hubs but it's a free floating zone we've just put in place some rules so that we don't extract from that important bus route um in 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 that zone so i think the key difference really is is that um rural tends to be slightly more towards the free floating and peri-urban slot tends to be slightly more towards the feeder but we have to take each use case as it comes and and if you look at paris where we have 40 different zones we have every single um service design possible there and you really just have to think about it holistically and, and see what the need is for that that, that territory and just on that um because th there's been some questions around uh padam and we drt and and how you work together which i'd like to come on to to both of you but just because i um i didn't address some of the questions that came through earlier and you mentioned paris there again jack there have been a couple of questions around is there a real is a is a really fair comparison to compare you know France and the UK um, and I guess you know you could say that about comparison of any two different territories even within the UK but you know how how would you address that question but also I guess what whilst not a like for like comparison what are the main takeaways from that that you think are applicable for the UK um, yeah so yeah yeah, like I understand that it's not completely like for like. We we have a completely different transport structure in the UK, um, but the, the the general concept is is similar. It's about filling holes in transport networks, and it's about um, if a service has been designed relatively poorly, is is DRT the answer to 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 feed core networks better and to grow patch, patronage. When I was a general manager for Arriva running bus depots, I had an outstation in a, in a place uh, in central beds called Leighton Buzzard. We had four or five MIDI buses that did town services that we could never really get profit making, but, but, but we kept because they fed our interurban network. And actually, the, the reason that the patronage was quite low was because the, the, the way that the, the town was designed, the buses had to had to go up and down pretty much every single road, even where there was no demand. And it would take three, four times the length of a car journey. So you get these huge traffic jams at Leighton Buzzard train station and we'd be running half empty buses. We could have if, if we if we use DRT in Leighton Buzzard, we could probably do a two to three bus operation with minibuses around Le Leighton Buzzard carry more people more efficiently so there's certain times where 
the existing bus network just doesn't work because of the geography and actually DRT can work in a really efficient way. There's other times that town services work really well and we don't want to extract from them. We want to complement them and serve a specific purpose. So I just think it's about looking at every case individually and just seeing where where DRT can enhance the service. And if it, if if the bus service is working well, well, there's not a more efficient way of carrying people than 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 sticking 50 to 70 people in a double-decker bus. It's it's proven to be the most commercially viable way of doing it. So 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 don't change it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks. Sorry. Did you want to come in, Dan? Sorry. Yeah. Just something that came from that. Um, it's really important, like what Jack just said about every situation is kind of different. Um, DRT is not the answer to everything. It's part of a wider network. Um, and what's really important is each area, each people that you're trying to serve have kind of different needs. There's different objectives with each DRT service. So for instance, um, we were doing some work on planning um, a service that was for a business park. And, and that business park, going into like specific needs of those workers um, in the morning and evening, um, these workers, they really just wanted to go to the train station and back. Um, and then in the daytime, what they actually wanted was to kind of different places in the local town, go to eat at different places. So really the, the thing to put on is not DRT for the whole time. Um, it's the optimal kind of service design for that was to put a shuttle on in the morning for the, put a shuttle on in the evening and transition to DRT throughout the day. So I think it's really important in the knowledge that each area is different, each people's needs are different, is to have that software um, that's configurable and that you can actually adapt and, and go out and and kind of meet people's specific needs it's not a one-size-fits-all thing um, so that's another reason on the supply side um, when you're talking about super rural super urban areas and all the spectrum in between it's really important just to have something that's flexible and that you can kind of work with learn from the data and then iterate um, so yeah thanks Dan and and there's been a question around um, uh, which what are the projects that Padam and we DRT partner on currently? Um, so that so the person who's asked the question says they're only aware of the projects between VIA and WDRT in Coventry and Warwick. So um, I guess a question, you know, what, what are you working on currently and you know what what what's in the future for you two together? Yeah. Um, Jack, do you want to go? Sorry. Yeah, sure. So we have no uh, live operational projects uh, right now, but we have um a number of projects that are in the latter stages of being developed that will, that we hope to launch in the next uh, few months. So um, it's only been in the past few months that we've we've really started to, to collaborate. I think um, um, there's a number of opportunities uh, where um, it's it's important to have one singular voice between an operator and a DRT platform um, because maybe procuring transport is not their core um, job. Um, and they 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 like the to have sort of a, a one size fits all package and and with Dan's comprehensive network of coach operators um, it, it just it just seems like a good fit to start to combine um, a platform with uh, with a flexible um, back office such as ours with then with a model of flexible supply such as Dan I think th there should be some really good strong use cases. Um, for for when we do operate, how we we can um, adapt our our sort of software to the needs of a customer, and then we can look at the data and and work with Dan and say, actually, we think you could take out a vehicle in the middle of the day, but actually we may may need a, an extra vehicle in the morning peak for two hours. How how does that fit with uh, your suppliers' uh, costings, and and can we make it work? Um, thanks for that, and and um. A question for um, it's for you, but but it links to another question, which I'll then point to Dan. So um, there was a question: Can Padam be used for taxis? Um, so um, I, I was going to say, I assume the answer to that is yes, but I'll let you answer it. So yeah, we have uh, use cases where we use taxis in very rural areas. Um, so we've got a subcontracting feature um, where um, the operator of our platform can have subcontractors and we can dedicate duties to um, sub, subcontractors as, as in taxis um, where there's a specific need. Maybe maybe the uh, the the requested journey isn't particularly suitable for 
for the core operator as it's quite far out in the region and, and it's more cost effective just to use a local taxi company. So um, so yeah, we, 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 can, we can use taxis and we're also exploring um, some interesting models with a UK car club where um, they have, um, they have uh, a number of vehicles that are being underutilized um, in the car club and how can we partner with a bus operator to, for the bus operator to provide the, um, the drivers um, and then the car club to complement an existing DRT service. Um, and basically it would just be a case of utilizing that car club um, vehicles at certain times of the day. Um, again, it's just thinking about different ways to combine different fleets, to combine, combine different funding pots, um, to really try and drive that, um, that cost of DRT down. And, and also to really look at the ramp up period, because you and me both know, Asia, that DRT is incredibly expensive in the early months uh, when patronage is low. So if you can really try to match supply and demand eff eff efficiently, then you can see a, a huge saving in the net cost in that really important first 18 months when the when the growth is is um, is is building. Thanks, Jack. And just link to that. So, so for you, Dan, because. Um... You know what Jack's really talk about there is having a really mixed fleet um, of operators so that you can be you know really flexible. But there's been some questions around the costs and 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 how you reconcile that. So you know an example question is you know what about um, taxi oper operators? Are they prepared to work for a for a bus service rate? But I suppose the broader question is when you have different fleet operators with different requirements and who p potentially value their journeys differently how do you how do you manage that on one platform and and um you know how can how can that help in terms of scalability and um viability of a DRT yeah so in some situations we kind of just do a, an auction type platform for that flexible supply so say in two weeks time we've got a, a four hour chunk where we anticipate that we need um, extra supply uh, we'll just go to auction um, with, with our different operators that we have on that flexible network. So you just ensure that you get the best rate because um, that way you can kind of capitalize on if an operator has had a cancellation, they really just want to utilize that vehicle and um, keep the driver um, kind of on, on the shift um, after a cancellation. Um, or if someone's from out of town, um, going to be passing by somewhere um, and can actually jump in and, and join that supply you can capitalize on those little situations where you can get really good costs um so yeah it, it's all about being flexible and, and working with the suppliers i think at the core of it it's just about having a great relationship with those suppliers um, and that's really just fundamental and kind of the wheels on the road the kind of the heart of every drt service um because without the drivers the vehicles the operators um none of, none of the tech would be able to kind of go to work um, so, so that's really key. So that's why we kind of have supplier operations team in place, um, working day to day, like making good relationships with, with operators, trying to give them extra private hire work from the other side of our business as well um, through the same platform. Um, so, yeah, it, it's all about that relationship. And then link question just coming from David, actually. Um, so how how does having a mixed fleet, um, how, how is that dealt with from a licensing point of view? So. Um, Obviously, it's PHV license if you're if you're a taxi, you're operating under a um, bus registration, albeit a flexible um, uh, service as opposed to a fixed route. But how how is that? How can you deal with that when you've got a mixed fleet? Yeah, sure. So um, in terms of utilising um, taxis, we've 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 done that uh, in France and other countries. So obviously, the legislation is slightly different. I think. Where we're speaking with the car club, I'm also planning to speak to the DFT to say, is there an innovation trial we can do here um, to to blend these fleets? Um, would it be possible to to run uh, a DRT under a private hire license and a DRT um, uh, with uh, a, a uh, under a bus flexible bus registration in the same area so that um, so that we can we can mix and match that that could be one option that we bring to the DFT. Another one really is if anyone who requests an accessible vehicle is provided an accessible vehicle, but if someone hasn't got accessible needs, and we can see who has accessible needs through um, adding filters onto, the, to, onto our app, 
if in that use case we provide a non-accessible vehicle, is that acceptable from the DFT's point of view? Because if anyone in that area asks for requests an accessible vehicle, they'll have one available. But actually, potentially in some cases, people people would be able to um, book and then a, a non-accessible vehicle comes. But uh, so it's about working with the DFT to see how we can tr try different things and be innovative um, to, to help the development of DRT going forward. Yeah, and I think fundamental. I'm conscious there's still more questions coming on. We've, we've only got a few minutes left. Can you believe this hour has gone so quickly? Um, but but yeah, I, I mean, the fundamental difference with private hire licenses is, is, is the ability to flex the cost of that seat um, by time of day and, and, and different external factors, which, as we know, is um, is not impossible, but a different challenge with bus. And I guess that's all part of your thinking of what you'll be part of your discussions with DFT around potential changes. So changing tack, because I want to try and get in as many of these questions as we can. Um, how important do you think through ticketing is for DFT where it's being used as a feeder service? Um, so we've not, I know there was another masterclass on ticketing, I'm sure you went into detail on this again, but but very briefly, because we haven't, don't have too long left. Can I, can I come to you, Jack, on that one? Yeah, sure. So I think it's incredibly important. Um, we have a clear roadmap with Ticketer into how we're going to um, blend DRT with uh, with fixed line ticketing. We also have four different um, live operations with mass providers, where by its nature, um, through ticketing is available through through the mass app. I think the simpler both the ticketing and the user experience can be, the more likely people are to use it as an option. I know that people, especially in the UK, are quite put off by using one or more um, buses uh, in, a, in a route. Not so much in, in, in mainland Europe because the connections seem to be a bit more um, reliable and the networks are, are built in a way that um, that uh, getting two buses is, is, is more of a commonplace. So we do have some obstacles in the UK to, to, to sort of change behaviour when it comes to uh, using one or more, or sorry, two or more buses or modes of transport. But if the ticketing can be simple and integrated, and you can guarantee through uh, the back office and through the algorithms that your DRT will interconnect with the next mode of transport, then I think we can have some real success um, in using feeder services here. And do you have any examples where that's integrated, did you say now, even if it's not in the UK, in Europe? Yeah, yeah. so for example, um, uh, in Paris, if I use Paris again, um, you can use your tram and bus tickets um, on the DRT. So the DR, the, every single trip you make in the Paris network, I think is about one euro, one euro 20 cents. And you get these little tiny... Um, Clips that you put into a, a reader. It's quite old school, but it's integrated. It's old school, but it works. You get you get your 10 slips for 10 euro and you can use that on the DRT. You can use that on the bus. You can use that on the train. So it's not a techie solution. It's just um, a, a, it's just an integrated ticket the same way that you'd have a travel card in London. But then we also have four different integrations with mass providers globally where there's all a whole host of different mobility solutions. You have one app. You can you can buy uh, free tickets through that app, um, but that's a different concept because it's it's us integrating into their 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 network. So we have four live examples of that as well. So um, thanks, Jack. We've we've hit two o'clock. I'm conscious that some people might have to disappear, um, and um, I just want to to apologise for anyone's question that I've not got to. Thank you so much for all the questions that you've put into the chat. Um, I assume, Jack and Dan, you are happy for anyone to follow up with you outside of this session. Um, I, I know Janet from Local Authority, other people who want to come and get in touch and, and ask more detailed questions. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking yeah. on your behalf. I'm sure you'd welcome that. Um, I, I guess just in terms of wrapping up, um, is there anything, is there any kind of last, can I just come to you both and I would ask you to keep it, it really succinct if you can, but um, kind of just last points that, you know, you would want people to take away from from this and on this topic um, uh, be, before everyone goes away. So Jack, to yourself first. Yeah, for me, my my sort of 
uh, mantra for, for DRT is start small, have clear KPIs in place. If the KPIs are achieved, look to grow. If the KPIs aren't achieved, look for something else. So have a really clear plan of where, where you launch, what your KPIs are in terms of patronage, in terms of revenue, in terms of passenger experience use them as a basis and then look to expand from there and, and scale. It doesn't need to be 20 vehicles from day one. It can be small, but it's all about having a clear plan for scaling. Thanks, Jack. And Dan? Yeah, yeah, it kind of, it kind of echoes that, what I was going to say. Um, you're never going to be able to um, simulate exactly what the demand or the optimal supply should be. Um, you just want that structure, that foundation, um, in the early stages, whether it's a one, two, three or four vehicle operation at trial, you want that foundation to be able to scale efficiently. Um, so you need to have the kind of setup that, that you can react to data that comes in. You need to obviously be monitoring and cleansing and, and reporting on that data. But then with the insights that you get, you need the foundation to really be able to iterate the service. Uh, so that's kind of exactly kind of why we've, we've built WeDRT. Um, we're building that on the supply side. Um, Padam got on the, the front front end user facing side. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's really really key for me. Thanks, Dan. So um, I guess all that remains is for me to say thank you. Thank you so much to um, the audience that have dialed in and for all the the interactive questions. That's what makes for a really uh, useful discussion and thank you Jack and Dan for for answering all the questions fired at you um, really comprehensively so uh, yeah and thank you to Landor Links um, uh, for hosting and facilitating uh, the masterclass and importantly to Padam who has sponsored this masterclass so everyone can join in. Um, just in terms of uh, housekeeping, a recording of this webinar will be sent to all delegates uh, by email and it'll be posted on YouTube as well. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for joining in for the last hour. I hope you found it useful. Thanks, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you, Asia. Thanks, Dan. Thanks all. Thanks, Asia. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs>